Hello, and welcome to the It's the Read You Need channel. Please like, share, and subscribe. And please leave a comment with any suggestions for future material. You Gentiles by Maurice Samuel Chapter 11 The Masses It would be absurd to pretend that the Jewish masses are distinguished from your masses by a conscious appreciation of the differences I have described. Indeed, very few, even of the thinking Jews, understand the nature of the problem. It is certain that the westernised masses of Jews are doing their best to minimise, or to ignore, the difference between Jew and Gentile. They and their leaders assert, frequently and vehemently, that there is no difference. Jew and Gentile are alike, except in their opinions regarding certain very simple matters of faith. You, too, will assert, even if we grant this distinction between Gentile and Jewish genius, are we to understand that it permeates the masses, that the strain of seriousness is to be found in your hundreds of thousands of westernised workers, lawyers, salesmen, merchants, manufacturers, contrasting with a corresponding levity or lack of seriousness in the same classes among us. It is incredible. The same language, the same occupations, the same sports, the same pursuits are common to both of us. Let any intelligent man live first for ten years among middle-class Gentile families, and then change his milieu completely and pass into the environment of the middle-class, assimilated Jewish families. What will there be to give the impression of another world? Will he not find the same amusements, the same ambitions, the same morality, the same taboos, the same abilities and the same stupidities? Do not the Jewish and Gentile middle-class families admire the same heroes, vote for the same politicians, read the same newspapers and magazines, frequent the same theatres, weep over the same movies, laugh at the same comic strips? But the question cannot be put so simply. This world is yours, and you are the ones who set the standards. You are the ones who supply the material for the reactions. And when we Jews want to become part of your world, enjoy its privileges and pleasures, we must accept your standards, speak, as it were, the same language. But just as a word can never mean quite the same thing to two persons, so a common expression does not mean the same emotion. The fact is that as long as Jews retain their identity, there is the same tension between your middle classes and ours as between your genius and ours. Our middle classes, even when thoroughly modernised, retain a certain individuality which is repugnant to you. And though, if forced to say a yes or no answer to the question above enunciated, I should have to answer, yes. There is a difference, difficult to describe, but felt and resented nonetheless. Our modernised Jews have done their best to take up your life and become part of it, but despite outward appearances they have failed. There is, first of all, too eager and intense a desire to be Gentile. What you do tacitly, and by the grace of God, we do deliberately and in the gracelessness of ambition. You grew into this new life of yours. We contort ourselves into it. In one or two generations, we would achieve what it took you a hundred generations to reach. We take up your life with an anxiousness, a ferocity, which is its own undoing. Whatever in you can be imitated, we do imitate admirably. But though you cannot quite define it, you are aware of a deception. Our patriotisms are hysterical. Our sports pursuits are unnaturally eager. 
our business ambitions artificially passionate. We seek the same apparent ends as you, but not in the same spirit. Would you have us fight and die for country? We'll do it as well as you. Would you have us run fast, box skillfully? We'll do it. Would you have us build up enterprises? We'll do that too. But one thing we cannot do. Do it for the same reason and in the same spirit. Since you insist, we will measure values with your standards and register the results. But you know, you feel, that the standards are not ours. We betray ourselves, singly and in mass. We haven't the manner. And we haven't the manners, for manners are but a manner with you. We Jews are lacking in manners because manners, as you have evolved them, are a spirit, a reflex of your play world. Manners cannot be copied. One must have the aptitude for this charming triviality. A single note of insistence spoils it all, and we Jews insist too much. And just as Jews are without manners, so they are without vulgarity. I have observed that between the vulgar Gentile and the so-called vulgar Jew there is a singular and dreadful difference. The vulgar type of Gentile is not repellent. There is in him an animal grossness which shocks and braces, but does not horrify. He carries it off by virtue of a natural brutality and brutishness, which provide a mitigating consistency to his character. But the lowest type of Jew is extraordinarily revolting. There is in him a suggestion of deliquescent putrefaction. The Gentile can be naturally, healthily vulgar. The Jew corrupts into vulgarity. He has not the gift for it. What is vulgarity in the Gentile is obscenity in the Jew. I am able to watch, either with amusement or indifference, a vulgar performance on the Gentile stage. On the Jewish stage, I find it intolerably loathsome. In the company of low and brutish Gentiles let loose, I may not feel at home, but I can be an unmoved spectator. But when Jews try to imitate this behaviour, I feel my innermost decency outraged. Well-mannered Gentile society rejects us. So does vulgar Gentile society. An individual genius cannot be taken as the higher type of the people which produced him. But in the mass there is an inevitable correspondence between the product of the geniuses of a people and the people itself. Studied actuarially, the people finds utterance in the geniuses. This is an undoubted consistency in all the products of the greatest Jewish minds. Whether we take these statistics literally, through an age, or vertically, through history, we will obtain a similar result. Whether we begin with the Bible and take the sum total of our work down to Karl Marx, or confine ourselves to a single country and generation, brackets, America today, for instance, with Untermeyer, Lewishon, Frank and Hecht, close brackets, we will find the same appeal to fundamentals, the same passionate rejection of your sport world and its sport morality, the same ultimate seriousness, the same inability to be merely playful, merely romantic, merely lyrical. It is unthinkable that the masses of a people can mean one thing, its genius is another. Were this so, the utterances of great minds would lose all relevance, would become pointless and impotent. If we symbolise a people as a single organism, its geniuses may be likened to an organ of self-consciousness. And the self-consciousness of a man is not an independent function. 
but the instrument of all of him. All his body and being thinks, through the brain. That which genius illuminates in this life, from which it springs. The amorphous is crystallised in it. The confused diffusion is brought to a focus, so that the pattern is made clear. Our geniuses, in the midst of your world, are an alien and destructive element, more clearly revealed as such because they are articulate. They are our spokesmen, or, better said, ourselves in utterance. They, like us, being us, cannot join your game. You say, because they lack imagination. In a sense, it is true. We are unimaginative, as old people are unimaginative in the presence of young people. We neither play with emotions nor with things. We lack romanticists as we lack inventors, because we lack inventiveness. Even among the masses, where diffusion confuses, an apt instance points to the truth. Among our simple people, you do not find the delight of constructive trifles, which is one of your characteristics. Your simple people like to build things, fix this and that in the house, play the handyman. They take pleasure in putting up shelves, looking to the plumbing, adding and altering. We are devoid of this kind of craftsman's pleasure. We do what is necessary only because it is necessary, and as a man, engaged happily in such pleasant, childlike pursuits, resents the chilling indifference of an unsympathetic onlooker, so your world resents our uncalled-for analysis of your acts and occupations. This is your life, and you enjoy it. Why do we disturb you with questions concerning ultimate values? We lack innovativeness. You will say that this springs from our lack of vitality. Men are lyrical because life sings in them. They are inventive because life is restless in them and drives their fingers to activity. I will not argue the cause of the difference, but, lacking inventiveness, we also lack sympathy for it. In your delight, you call inventiveness the conquest of nature. But the boast is, to us, a foolish and a childlike boast. The problem with which man is faced cannot be answered by scientific inventions. The conquest of nature does not lie in evolving keener sight, swifter motion, larger strength. This is but magnification, which leaves the element of the problem untouched. Can you conquer, not nature, but the nature of things? For it is in the nature of things that the bitter problem resides. If science should double the span of human life, will the nature of life and death be altered? Will we not feel as mortal, as insignificant? Will we even be aware of living longer? If science should bridge the planets and the stars, will the new playground be larger than the old to those that live in it? You have found a whole world since the days of the Greeks. They lived on a tiny plot of earth, an ant hill, and you have a gigantic globe to build on. What difference has it made? What significant conquest have you achieved? Not things, but the nature of things baffle us. The dreadful circle. The eternal balance. For every gain, a compensating loss. For every new revelation, a new deception. For every new extension, a loss of intensity. The nature of things cannot be solved because we partake of that nature. We can never get round ourselves, we can only turn round. Your world spins in a joyous illusion of progress. We, untouched by that illusion, destructive in your mood, stand aside, static, serious. We will be satisfied with nothing but the absolute. That 
aloofness speaks clearly or obscurely in our masses as well as in our geniuses. Dealing with objects instead of with laws, they betray the same unenthusiastic objectivity in their attitudes to your world. And as long as they retain their Jewish identity, they will, despite denial and efforts to the contrary, remain the same. End of chapter 11